Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadee Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is the real restart of our group learning program. On Wednesday, we called that our new start of the group learning program, but essentially we just talked about some very basic things related to the Buddha, the path to enlightenment and what is enlightenment. And we kind of talked about the overview of the program and helping you understand what the program is. So if you are joining us today for the first time and you haven't seen that class, you can go back and look at it because it's in YouTube, it's in Facebook, it's on our podcast, and you'll be able to see what we talked about so that you'll understand the overall structure of the program and how we proceed. But it's really these Sundays where we really kind of dive into the teachings and really talk a lot about what the Buddhist teachings are and helping you on this path to enlightenment. And then we use our Wednesdays to help you understand your meditation practice and building up your meditation practice. So if you're only able to see us live on Sunday, that's completely fine because you can see the recordings on the Wednesday classes that we do either in Facebook, YouTube, or in our podcast. So I'd like to just welcome all of you guys to join us for this group learning program, which is a seven month program to help you learn and reflect and practice the teachings of the Buddha. As we progress through this program, it's structured in a certain way to really help you get the most benefit out of learning these teachings and practicing them in your daily life. The goal of these teachings is to help you move the mind to the enlightened mental state. What enlightenment is, is the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, where you no longer experience any discontentedness whatsoever. So the mind won't experience in the enlightened mental state, sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy, any kind of displeasure or dissatisfaction, the mind will be completely at ease, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy for the rest of this existence. And the whole path that the Buddha taught is guiding you towards that goal. And the way that his teachings work is there's no belief in them whatsoever. No matter what you've been taught in the past and other traditions or even in the Buddhist tradition, the Buddhist teachings, when you read them, when you study them, when you reflect on them and you practice them, there shouldn't be any kind of belief in the teachings whatsoever. Because if you just believe the teachings, it's not actually going to lead to enlightenment. Because with belief, you don't know whether it's true or false. What the Buddhist teachings are about is exposing you through intellectual learning to the wisdom of the Buddha of what he knew to be the truth of the natural laws of existence. But the only way that you get to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy that is unshakable is if you do the work to learn intellectually, reflect on those teachings, and then move them into practice so that you can see the truth for yourself and you gain wisdom. And by doing so, then the mind becomes unshakable and you can reside through understanding these natural laws of existence and making better and better decisions in your life. You've already done this in a lot of different ways throughout your life. You just might not be aware of it, where you've learned something intellectually, you've reflected on it, and you've practiced it to see the truth. And then once your mind awakened to that wisdom, you were able to live life more peacefully and exist in the world more peacefully. A couple of examples of that are like when you learned about the natural law of gravity, for example. 
when we were children and we were growing up and we were learning how to walk, our legs weren't strong enough. We didn't have the balance to navigate the natural law of gravity. At age one, two, three, we kept falling. We kept hitting our knees, our elbows, our head. We would place our toys places and they would fall down and break or we would knock over glasses of water and we would cry every time we fall down and this natural law of gravity that we didn't understand we kept getting discontent because we didn't understand it but over the course of our life we became six years old eight years old we started not only walking but we started running and jumping we started learning how to ride a bicycle but still there were times where we didn't tie our shoe and we would trip over our shoe and we would fall but by the time we were kind of 12 or 13 or 14 we started really understanding this natural law of gravity and we started functioning in the world very differently we started making different choices through the wisdom of the natural law of gravity that we awaken to we started making decisions to be sure that we tied our shoes every single time and tie them really tight or in a double knot to make sure that they didn't come undone we looked down where we were walking and looked at the sidewalk and looked for any places where it was uneven and made sure that we were walking in a way that ensured that we didn't keep falling down. Certain nice things that we had that we didn't want to break, we placed them in a special area or a special place where we know they wouldn't get knocked over. And through understanding or awakening or gaining this wisdom of the natural law of gravity, we gradually started making different choices in the world that led to different results. And we started to kind of peacefully coexist in the world very differently with regard to this natural law of gravity because we had this wisdom. And we're at the point today where if we could, we would be able to travel all over the world because we understand the natural law of gravity. We might even be able to go up on a ladder or a step stool or do all kinds of other things because we have the wisdom of this natural law. Or we might choose to not do certain things because of this wisdom of the natural law of gravity. Our mind is unshakable on this natural law. We know that it's there. It affects us whether we knew about it or not. When we were a child, this natural law of gravity was affecting us, even though we didn't know about it. So once we awaken to the wisdom, then we can start making better and better choices. Well, the Buddhist teachings are exactly the same way. There's these natural laws of existence that the unawakened, unenlightened mind doesn't understand. And because of that misunderstanding or that lack of wisdom, the mind experiences discontentedness. It experiences sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy. All of those discontent feelings that I mentioned in others keep being repeated over in the mind in this constant cycle over and over because we lack the wisdom of these natural laws. So it's through learning these natural laws and understanding them that then the mind is able to have this wisdom and make better and better choices in the world. But we can't gain that wisdom just through belief. Belief won't allow us to gain the truth and understand the wisdom of these natural laws. So the way that students learn and awaken to this enlightened wisdom of the Buddha is you learn with a teacher intellectually through the resources that the teacher provides, like books, videos, podcasts, audiobooks, classes, retreats, things like this, maybe personal guidance. You learn actively. It's your own independent journey, but you see guidance with a teacher in order to understand those teachings intellectually. Once you're doing that intellectual learning, which is a repetitive process, it's a gradual, slow process of learning. You also do reflection where you look inward and you try to determine, is this the truth or not? And we're going to do some of this today. And as you start reflecting and looking inward and you contemplate and you think about the teachings, you still need to move the teachings into practice where you start practicing the teachings and look around in the world and start seeing, is these teachings actually the truth or are these teachings actually the truth? And through that, when you discover the truth, then you've acquired wisdom and your mind becomes unshakable. 
Once again, you've done this before. If you've grown up in a culture where you were taught about Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, at one time you had a belief in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. And then over time, as you aged, something happened and you acquired the truth. For me, it was my sister telling me at age eight that she saw our parents eating the cookies on Christmas night. And it really crushed me as a child that here my parents are lying to me about this being we call Santa Claus. But finally, our parents admitted to us that, yeah, there's no such thing as Santa Claus. So you get the truth. And then you look around the world and you see a Santa Claus at this mall. You see one at that mall. You see one at this mall. And you know that Santa Claus couldn't have gone to all those places in that quick of a period. So you gain this truth through practicing and you gain this wisdom that you know that without a shadow of a doubt, Santa Claus doesn't exist. No matter how many Christmas carols you hear, no matter how much people talk about Rudolph and all these other things, That belief that you once had is eliminated through your inner reflection and through practicing and seeing the truth for yourself that now your mind is unshakable, that no matter what anybody says to you about Santa Claus, you know without a shadow of a doubt that he doesn't exist or the tooth fairy doesn't exist. Well, that's what these teachings ultimately lead to, that by you learning intellectually, reflecting on those teachings and practicing them, not believing the teachings, but you come to understand the truth. And then through that truth, you gain and acquire wisdom. And now on your own, with your own free will, you make better decisions in the world that lead to more improved results and a better way of life. These teachings that the Buddha taught He didn't say when he awakened from enlightenment that he had discovered a new religion, right? Today, a lot of people consider Buddhism a religion where I don't really think of it that way. What the Buddha essentially said, not that I discovered a new religion, he said, I discovered a better way of life. I discovered a better way of conducting himself in the world. And it's through learning those natural laws of existence, seeing the truth, gaining the wisdom that his mind moved gradually to this enlightened mental state where it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. The Buddha didn't sit down and instantly attain enlightenment. This is one of the larger myths in the world about the Buddha. He talks in his teachings that it's a gradual process of gradually learning and understanding the natural laws that the mind gradually awakens. And he talks about it as gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress that you will experience this diminishing of discontentedness gradually to the point where the mind awakens and no longer experiences these discontent feelings. Well, this better way of life that he talked about in this path to enlightenment is the eightfold path. The eightfold path is the way to eliminate discontentedness. It is the path to enlightenment. And in this program, there's about 24 chapters and some other additional material that I'm going to walk you through step by step each week. But here, the first four weeks, I kind of spend time to do an overview of the entire path to enlightenment while also getting very deep into the actual teachings. So this eightfold path is chapter five in the book because it's a really important part of the path. It is the path to enlightenment. So it shows up really early in the book, but rather than kind of waiting, you know, five weeks or so before you get to that, I start off the program right away, giving you this overview and understanding of what the Eightfold Path is and using our time to dive into it really deeply as we progress. Because rather than just spend one week on the Eightfold Path, we're going to actually be spending the next three weeks breaking the Eightfold Path into three separate sections called Wisdom, Moral Conduct, and Mental Discipline. This Eightfold Path that the Buddha laid out for us, it's eight individual steps. And these eight steps are segmented into three categories. Today, we're going to be discussing right view, right intention, which makes up the wisdom. And you'll understand why as we talk today and I expose you to those teachings, you'll understand why this is called wisdom. 
Then next Sunday, we're going to be talking about the moral conduct or right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And then the following Sunday, we're going to be in the mental discipline, which is right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So you can see here where we've just essentially laid out three individual classes. This is part one of a three-part series where you're going to be getting an overview of the path, but we're actually going to be spending a lot of time on each individual step so that we can really penetrate it and you can see how this path lays out. And then at the end of these three classes, we're going to spend our fourth class on talking about the four stages of enlightenment, the 10 fetters, which are things that need to be removed from the mind in order to attain enlightenment. And we're going to talk about the seven factors of enlightenment, which are seven tools that you can use in order to move the mind to enlightenment. And then at that point, that's where we'll start chapter one and we'll go through the book from there. So you'll see as we get started, this is kind of a, a nice way of kind of spending the next four weeks of getting your mind around the understanding of the Buddhist teachings and then kind of moving towards that uh, later with a chapter by chapter progression through the book. So I would uh, once again like to welcome you for this program because as you progress through learning, if you do the work to learn and practice, while you're learning in these classes, but then also practice outside of class, meditation, and then practice the teachings that the Buddha shares, you will see for yourself the truth that the discontentedness of the mind gradually diminishes. For most students, when they're starting to learn like this, within a matter of a few weeks, if they start practicing, they can observe there's a diminishing of discontentedness, meaning things that once created anger in the mind or you experienced anger as a result of some experience, what you're going to notice is those same things will happen for you having practiced the teachings for a few weeks and now you're just kind of frustrated. You're not angry, you're just kind of frustrated and you keep practicing for several weeks and then that same thing will happen and now you're just kind of annoyed and then you keep practicing for many weeks and then that same thing will happen and you feel nothing at all. You, the mind is completely peaceful. This is how the mind gradually moves to liberation or to enlightenment. And this is what I'm going to be introducing you to over the next few weeks. But then in a more detailed way, we're going to be really helping you to build up your life practice where more and more through you training your own mind, you will be able to experience the results of the mind getting closer and closer to enlightenment. Now in seven months, you're not going to experience enlightenment, but you're definitely going to experience progress on this path. And that's why these teachings aren't based on belief, that if you don't believe and you instead look into the teachings and investigate them, you reflect on them and you practice them, you will see the truth and the wisdom in these teachings you will start making different decisions in your life based on your own free will. And because of the results of your decisions, you will see the progress as the mind goes forward and it starts to diminish this discontentedness. You'll see that truth for yourself. As we start talking about the Eightfold Path, it's important that you understand that everything that the Buddha taught is based on what's called the natural law of gamma. Just like the natural law of gravity, you were unawakened to that at one point. What the path to enlightenment is really about is awakening to this natural law of gamma, or you might have more popularly heard this referred to as karma. Karma is the Sanskrit way of referring to this. Gamma is the Pali word, and it's the only Pali word that I use because there's no other one word translation to refer to this. Everything else that I use in this program is all English. But the word gamma doesn't really translate to just one word in English. What the natural law of gamma is, is its cause and effect, or action and result. Essentially, there's some cause, there's some action, and that creates a certain effect or a certain result. Essentially, the results of our decisions. That's what gamma is. If we decide to do unwholesome things in the world, then unwholesome things are going to happen for us. 
if we decide to do wholesome things in the world, wholesome things will happen for us. All too often in the world, we hear about karma or gamma, and we think that it's this magical, mystical thing. We think it's punishment and rewards. It's almost like this black cloud following over you. That's not what the natural law of gamma is at all. Instead, it's just the result of your decisions. And what the Eightfold Path is going to provide for you is it's going to provide you an understanding of this natural law of gamma so that you can see the cause and effect or action and result of all the things that we experience in our life. And through you doing that, you will come to decide on your own to make wiser and wiser choices. But that's your decision to be able to do that. So in order to help you along this path, I would like to share some of the words of the Buddha with you to help you see exactly what he was teaching related to this Eightfold Path and specifically these two steps that we're talking about today, which is right view and right intention. Because by learning with the words of the Buddha, you don't have to believe what I say, but you also shouldn't believe what the Buddha says either. So as I teach today, I'm going to be pausing at different times, sharing with you how you can take what I'm sharing with you and what you're learning intellectually. You can reflect on it and then you can practice it in the world and see the truth for yourself. So here, let's just look at some of the Buddha's words before we move into kind of a, a way that I would explain this. Here, the Buddha is talking about right view as part of his Eightfold Path. He says, and what, monks, is right view? Right view is really, really important. Without right view, you would never be able to attain enlightenment. This is how you establish your understanding of all the rest of the path that the Buddha has to teach you. He says, It is, monks, the wisdom of discontentedness, the wisdom of the cause of discontentedness, the wisdom of the elimination of discontentedness, and the wisdom of the way of practice leading to the elimination of discontentedness. This is called right view. Well, here what he's pointing to in the Eightfold Path is he's pointing back to what we call the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha has this centralized teaching of the Eightfold Path, which is the core central teaching that he has, which is the path to enlightenment. And then all of his other teachings in one way or another will plug into this Eightfold Path. The Four Noble Truths is the very first discourse that he gave after he attained enlightenment. And when he attained enlightenment and gave this first discourse of the Four Noble Truths, then that led to further investigation of his first five students who then continue to learn and more and more people continue to learn and experience this enlightened mental state. This is how they knew he was a Buddha is that they experienced the diminishing of their discontentedness so they could tell that their mind was not angry anymore. Their mind was not sad. They weren't feeling boredom or loneliness. So they knew that these teachings that the Buddha was sharing and what they were choosing to practice through this wisdom was leading to a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. Well, the Eightfold Path has a lot more steps that are continue to be taught as part of this. But since we're just focusing on right view, I just pulled that out to show it to you. And then I just pulled out one little piece of the Four Noble Truths. There's actually a whole lot of other words besides that. But below here, this teaching from the Buddha on right view is the first part of him teaching the Four Noble Truths, where you can see that right view is clearly pointing back to the Four Noble Truths as being what the Buddha considered right view. And this is where he says, monks, there are these Four Noble Truths. What for? The noble truth of discontentedness, the noble truth of the cause of discontentedness, the noble truth of the elimination of discontentedness, the noble truth of the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. This is continuing from here after this, where he describes the Four Noble Truths. So what I would like to do for you is now help you establish right view. Now that you can kind of see some of the teachings in, in the book, 
you'll see that I put the entire Eightfold Path in the words of the Buddha. I put the entire Four Noble Truths in the words of the Buddha. And there's other places throughout this volume one where I put the words of the Buddha in a box. And then I use my words in order to help you understand what the Buddha was actually teaching. But I put his words right there side by side so you can see that what I'm sharing is indeed connected directly to what the Buddha taught. So in order to establish right view, this first important step of the Eightfold Path, you need to understand what we call the three universal truths in order to understand the four noble truths. The reason why we call them truths is because the Buddha knew they were truth. I know they're truth. Other people who have studied these and reflected on them and practiced them know that they're truth. But in order for you to attain enlightenment and to progress on this path, you will need to learn them, reflect on them and practice them so that you can see the truth for yourself. And I'm going to help you do that today. I'm going to introduce you to the teaching intellectually. I'm going to invite you to reflect on it. And then I'm going to help you see how to practice it so that you can then discover the truth and acquire the wisdom of these truths. This first of the three universal truths is called impermanence. The universal truth of impermanence is essentially sharing with you that everything is constantly changing, that there is no permanent state. Whatever arises is going to change and then it's going to cease to exist. So all material objects, possessions, relationships, thoughts, ideas, states of mind, everything in the world is constantly changing. All these feelings in the mind that you experience, whether it's anger, hatred, sadness, frustration, annoyance, shyness, boredom, loneliness, they're going to arise, they're going to change, and then they're going to cease to exist. But also things like material objects or relationships or things that we experience in this world, they're constantly changing. Okay, this is the universal truth of impermanence, but you don't believe this. You should never believe anything that I say or anything that you see that the Buddha said. Instead, you're invited to investigate and examine the teachings so then you can see the truth for yourself and acquire wisdom. So how do you do that? Well, what you do is now that you understand the Buddha's teaching the universal truth of impermanence, and he's saying that things are constantly changing, then if you can find in the world just one thing that doesn't change, that is permanent, then you will have disproven the Buddha. That's how you determine whether this is truth or not, is you look around the world around you. So for example, is your physical body permanent? Was this physical body born and it stayed the same permanently throughout your life? Or has it been constantly changing? It's been constantly changing. What about the hair that's on the head? Is, does that stay just one length? Or do you have to keep cutting it because it's growing? It's impermanent. Has it been the same color, the same texture your whole life? No, it's constantly changing. What about the job that you've had or the occupation? Has that been the same your whole life or is that constantly changing? And how about the income that you've experienced over the course of your life? Has that been the same from the beginning of your life and throughout your work career or has it been constantly changing? It's been constantly changing, right? What about the relationships in your life? Have you had the exact same relationships all the way through your life or have people been coming and going out of your life? They've been coming and going out of your life, right? So this is how you look internally and you see that, yeah, this is true. It's a universal truth that things are constantly changing. And this is important as we get ready to talk about the Four Noble Truths. So these are foundational teachings to help you understand the Four Noble Truths, which is really what's going to help you establish right view. So you need to soak into the mind and deeply understand that all these things around us are all impermanent. Even this class, right? We started this class, but it's not permanent. It's going to end at a certain point. 
and will be done and go off and do other things. If you don't see that things are indeed impermanent, you need to look around the world around you for the next few days or the next few weeks. See if you can find something permanent. You're walking down the sidewalk. It looks similar, but oh, there's a crack. That's impermanence. Oh, I'm talking on the phone, but it got disconnected. There's impermanence, right? You're using the internet and the internet's working, but then the Wi-Fi signal drops. Ah, there's impermanence. So and here we go. Here's a little bit of sound coming in, right? It was pretty quiet there for a while. And now someone's unmuted themselves or somehow got unmuted. So now there's a little bit of sound coming in, right? So there's this constant impermanence, this constant change. Everything's kind of in a state of flux. If you need help seeing this, when we get to our question time, be sure to raise your hand or ask a question and I'll help you to see if you think that something is permanent, you can put that into the comment section of Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Our moderators will see that and when we get to the question time, we can talk about that. And in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and we can talk about any questions that you have that way. But let's go on to the second universal truth. The second universal truth is called discontentedness. Some people will refer to this as suffering, or you might hear the Pali word of dukkha. I don't use those words, and I'll explain to you why in a little bit. But let me help you understand what is discontentedness before we talk about these other words that you'll sometimes hear. When the Buddha talked about discontentedness and this universal truth of discontentedness, he talked about a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, and a feeling that is neither painful nor pleasant. Pleasant feelings are things like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria, exhilaration. These are all pleasant feelings that the mind experiences. And then there's painful feelings, things like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, any of these kind of feelings are oftentimes very painful for people to experience. And then there's feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. For me, I put in this category boredom, loneliness, melancholy, shyness, displeased, uncomfortable, unsatisfied. And to me, those are neither painful nor pleasant. But some people tell me that boredom and loneliness is quite painful for them. And that's okay. You, you can consider those feelings painful. It doesn't really matter where those feelings end up in the various categories. What the Buddha taught is that the mind experiences discontentedness in the form of these three feelings. Pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. Now, you don't believe that. What you do is you look inward and you start reflecting. You start thinking, is that what the mind experiences? Do you experience pleasant feelings, happiness, excitement, elation, and so forth? Does the mind experience painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, and any others that you might decide to include in there? Does the mind experience feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, like shyness? You wouldn't say that being shy is pleasant, but it's probably not painful either. It's kind of neither painful nor pleasant. So if you can come up with just one feeling that doesn't fit into these three categories, then once again, you've disproven the Buddha. So you can look inwardly and you can look at the past and things that you've experienced in life and going forward as you start experiencing certain feelings from today forward, you can start noticing, ah, that's a pleasant feeling or ah, that's a painful feeling or oh, this is kind of like a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. So this is discontentedness. Now, the word that you'll sometimes hear people use for this is suffering, but I don't use this word suffering because suffering to me only really explains painful feelings. When I was shy, I wouldn't say I was suffering. Or when I experienced happiness, excitement, elation, I wouldn't say I was suffering. 
right? The mind's discontent because when you're so happy, excited, elated, sometimes you drop things, you trip, you twist your ankle, you fall down because you're so excited, right? The mind's discontent. It's unstable. It's shaken up. It's so thrilled. There's so much euphoria, right? But I wouldn't say I was suffering. Sure, sadness, anger, frustration, oh, guilt, shame, fear, oh, stress, anxiety, yeah, suffering, right? But that's discontentedness. It's a better way to refer to it. And then those feelings of neither painful nor pleasant, you know, dissatisfaction or displeased or uncomfortable, that's discontentedness. So if you see the word suffering in places where you look at the Buddhist teachings, if you replace this word discontentedness, it really fully captures what the Buddha was talking about when he was talking about this universal truth. Because the ultimate goal of the Buddhist teachings, as you're going to see, is to eliminate discontent feelings. What discontent feelings are is they're feelings that are based on impermanent conditions. So you get a new car. Oh, I'm so happy. I get a new pair of shoes. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, you make a new friend. Oh, I'm so elated, right? You're basing your inner feelings on some impermanent condition. And then that feeling is temporary. It fades away. There's no lasting satisfaction. There's no lasting contentment of mind because the unenlightened mind has based its inner feelings on some impermanent condition. Same thing when the mind experiences sadness or anger or frustration. It's basing its inner feelings on some impermanent condition. You hear or see something that you disagree with and you feel sadness or anger or frustration. And then likewise, the neither painful nor pleasant feelings come from that as well. Now, when I talk about the elimination of pleasant feelings, the enlightened mind is going to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. There's going to be plenty of joy, but it's unconditioned. It's not based on any condition. So an enlightened mind wakes up in the morning, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. All day long, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. They go to sleep, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world around them they can still maintain their peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because they're not basing their inner feelings on some impermanent condition. Their mind has been trained to the point to understand that that only causes frustration, that only causes these temporary feelings that arise in the mind, that change, and then fade away. And what an enlightened mind has done is unconditioned the mind so that it no longer bases its inner feelings on some impermanent condition. And see, the way that we've been taught growing up is that we're taught that everybody should be happy. We should be happy. Just be happy. Everybody be happy. Well, happiness is impermanent. That's why people continue to chase after happiness, but they can never hold it permanently because they're chasing after these impermanent conditions. Well, what makes happiness? Some people want wealth. Some people want a certain job title. Some people want other things in the world. Certain things that they want, they're chasing after those wants. And if they get those things, the mind is happy for a period of time, but then that fades away. So chasing after happiness is not going to actually lead to permanent happiness because the mind is basing its inner feelings on these impermanent conditions. But we're going to talk about that more when we get to the Four Noble Truths. Let me pause here and see if you guys have any questions on these first two universal truths. And just as a reminder, the way that you would ask questions is you would put your comments into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Our moderators, James, Bossom, Nick, are going to be helping us to see those and get your questions asked during the class. And then if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and the moderators will call on you and be sure you get a chance to ask your question or any follow-up questions during the class. So what it is about the pleasant feelings is it's their impermanence. That's the reason that puts them in the situation of causing discontent. Is that correct? 
Right. It's because they're impermanent. It's because the, the unenlightened mind has based its inner feelings on some impermanent condition that, you know, somebody that you were expecting to give you a phone call gives you a phone call. And now the mind is so happy, excited about that. But then tomorrow you have that same expectation. And because of impermanence, they can't call you. And now the mind experiences sadness. It can't experience that happiness excitement because of that impermanent condition. That condition of them calling you can't exist permanently. So as long as the mind is basing its inner feelings on some impermanent condition, it will experience happiness, excitement, sadness, anger, boredom, loneliness. Okay, maybe a little bit of peacefulness and calm there for a little bit, but then boom, right back to fluctuating around these discontent feelings. And this is what the unenlightened mind experiences on an ongoing basis. But an enlightened mind is going to have joy. The enlightened mind is going to enjoy life a whole lot more because it's actually no longer experiencing these discontent feelings where it's basing its inner feelings on some impermanent condition. It's just always joyful. You can almost think of it as unconditioned happiness rather than conditioned happiness. So it's kind of like this. Would you like someone to have conditional love where it's like they will love you if you meet all these conditions? Or would you rather have unconditioned love where people just love you just because they love you? This person who has unconditioned love, as soon as you stop meeting their conditions, because their love is conditioned on certain things being met, as soon as you don't meet their conditions, they don't love you anymore, right? And it's gone. The love is gone. Or would you like this unconditioned love where people just love you to love you? There's no reason other than you're a human being and they just love you, right? That's the difference between conditioned pleasant feelings versus these unconditioned mental state of joy that is experienced in the enlightened mental state. That this conditioned happiness is based on these conditions being met, the mind is happy. But as soon as those conditions aren't there anymore, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. But you can move the mind to be so well trained that it experiences this unconditioned joy where now it doesn't matter what's happening around you, the mind can always experience being joyful despite the things that are happening around you. So what the discontent mind is, is essentially a roller coaster and enlightenment is essentially getting off of that roller coaster and experiencing a conditioned joy. That's a good way to think of it, James, is even though roller coasters can be quite fun, being on a roller coaster in the mind that never ends and it just keeps going and going and going, experiencing these constant cycles of discontentedness is not an enjoyable thing in life. It's quite unenjoyable to experience things like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance. So if we welcome in these conditioned, pleasant feelings at some point because the mind is untrained, it's basing its inner feelings of pleasant feelings on these impermanent conditions. If we welcome these pleasant feelings based on impermanent conditions, then we're going to experience painful feelings at some point based on these impermanent conditions because of this constant change. So when you get off of that roller coaster and stop basing your inner feelings on these impermanent conditions, the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently where it no longer bases its inner feelings on what's going on around you, these impermanent conditions. We have a follow-up from Adrian on Facebook asking, does peace fall under this? And by this, I suppose it means this discontent feelings. Peacefulness is not part of discontentedness. Peacefulness is part of that peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy because peacefulness, true peacefulness, is not based on any conditions whatsoever. Any kind of conditioned feeling is going to be discontent, where peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, that is the enlightened mind, is an unconditioned mind, where the mind is no longer basing its inner feelings on impermanent conditions. And to follow up from Rich, 
Are we supposed to no longer have feelings? That sounds a little scary. That's not what the Buddha is teaching, is you're still going to experience feelings. You're just not going to have conditioned feelings. The mind is going to experience through training this mental discipline where you'll be able to control the mind rather than the feelings controlling you and sending you into these fits of rage or anger or frustration or feeling like someone's pulled the carpet out from under your feet and you get knocked down on your on your rear end instead of that being the experience where your mind is untrained through training the mind you will have mental discipline or control of the mind you'll still experience joy you'll still enjoy all kinds of things in the world it's just that you won't have this conditioned experiences where oh i see the sun out i'm happy oh it's raining i'm sad no you see the sun out the mind's joyful it's raining out i can still be joyful right so that's what we're talking about here is that if the mind continues to be unenlightened then when it's sunny out you might experience happiness and when it's raining you might experience sadness there's some people that see the sun and they're angry and when it rains they're happy right so they're allowing what's going on around them to constantly change their feelings and because the world around us is impermanent and constantly changing, if you base your inner feelings on these impermanent conditions, then your mind is just gonna constantly be bouncing around from thing to thing to thing. The Buddha is not teaching here and the enlightened mind is not emotionless. It's just that you have control and restraint and discipline over the mind where you don't allow the feelings to control you. So essentially, we'll no longer be giving power to external conditions over our peace of mind. We'll be empowered in ourselves over it, essentially. Right. Instead of reacting to situations out of hostility, anger, and frustration, you'll be able to respond to things with a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. You'll be able to make wise decisions that produce wholesome outcomes rather than making unwholesome decisions that are based in things like anger, for example, or even pleasantness, right? Sometimes we make decisions just because we want those pleasant feelings and we want those pleasant feelings so bad, we make certain decisions, we get further on that track and we realize that, you know, we are just making all these decisions to get those pleasant feelings and now those pleasant feelings are gone and now you've just made these decisions that you wouldn't have otherwise made. I sometimes would talk about this as like going through the forest and knocking down all the trees and burning up the forest. And you get to the end and it's like, whoa, what happened to the forest? So if you continue to allow the mind to base its inner feelings on these impermanent conditions, you're going to continue to experience this constant up and down in the mind. So an enlightened being is still experiencing a wonderful, wonderful life, much more so than an unenlightened mind because they're no longer experiencing any of these painful feelings. They're no longer experiencing any of these feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. They're not experiencing these conditions that are causing these inner feelings. Instead, they're experiencing life. They're seeing all this impermanence they're seeing all these changes that are happening, but they're just choosing because of the way that the mind is disciplined. They're trained the mind so well that they're choosing to no longer allow these impermanent conditions to create inner feelings. Let's go to Sajini now for a live question. Mm -hmm. Sir, so I believe in impermanence, but uh, when it comes to certain situations, I find it hard to accept them. So how do I kind of move past it and learn to accept it? Okay, thanks for your question. You shouldn't believe in impermanence. That's important, that you don't believe in impermanence, but instead that you see the truth for yourself, that indeed all of these things in the world are impermanent. Well, once you observe that all these things are impermanent, now what you need to do is move to training, which is what we talk about as part of the Eightfold Path, where you learn and practice the Four Noble Truths and all the other aspects of the Eightfold Path to train the mind 
to understand and accept impermanence and recognize it when it happens. So let us talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, which is going to be coming here in a bit. I'd like to introduce Basim now for our Zoom questions. Thank you, Jim. I have a question from Donnie. He asks, sir, is gratitude a discontent miss feeling? Gratitude is not a feeling, in my view. Gratitude is more of a mental state. It's more of something that you feel as a result of somebody having done something for you. Maybe you feel this gratitude towards somebody, right? So I don't think of it as discontentedness. I think of it more of a quality of mind or aspect of the mind. Hey, Rick has a question. He says, are the feelings discontentedness in and of themselves? Or is it the clinging onto these feelings? Okay, so let's talk about this. So discontentedness itself, I'm using that word to describe the mental state that one experiences when they have painful feelings, pleasant feelings, or feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. So the feelings themselves are individual feelings, but then when the mind is experiencing these conditioned feelings, we can say, the mind is discontent or discontented or that's discontentedness. So discontentedness is not the feeling itself, but it's the mental state that it experiences when it has pleasant feelings, painful feelings, or feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. Thanks, teacher. No more questions from now. Okay. So let's talk about this third universal truth, and then we'll move into the Four Noble Truths. This Third universal truth is something that I typically will introduce here, but it's something that someone will really kind of approach later in their practice, that this universal truth of non-self is not something that someone typically will understand and start to really wrap their arms around and practice at this point in your journey on the path to enlightenment. But let me at least introduce it to you so you understand it as part of the three universal truths. And then when we get to chapter 16, which is about 20 weeks from now, then we're going to dive in deeply into this universal truth of non-self and really expand it for you. And we'll also talk about it in chapter four as well. So just an introduction to the universal truth of non-self. What the Buddha is sharing here is that there is no permanent self, okay? The challenge for the unenlightened mind is that the unenlightened mind thinks that there is a self. The unenlightened mind mistakenly believes, falsely assumes, and has this misperception that there is a permanent self. The unenlightened mind will oftentimes associate the physical body as being the self or the mind as being the self. So if I said, you know, Rick, point to Rick, where is Rick? Or if I said, Zach, you know, point to Zach or Tony, point to Tony. Oftentimes people will point to the physical body in the direction of the physical body. But what you're essentially pointing to is a shirt, right? This shirt is not David. So we take that shirt off. I won't, but we take that off and we Where's David? So if somebody points, well, no, that's the skin. Okay, we take out the skin. Where's David? Oh, that's the ribs. Okay, we get rid of the ribs. Where's David? Okay, we're down to kind of organs and fluid and and tissue. None of that is David, but the mind thinks that this is David in the unenlightened state. And what happens is we struggle and we have difficulties where we associate this physical body as being David. And now we have this mental protection. Whereas if we hear somebody disparage the physical body or talk negatively about the physical body, then the mind becomes discontent because of it. Or if we have a certain self-identity, you might consider yourself a hard worker or you are a person from Sri Lanka or Egypt or America or the UK or Australia or Japan or China or something like this. And if you see yourself identifying 
as being a certain person from a certain group, a certain ethnicity, or from a certain country, this self-identity that the mind holds on to, thinking this is who you are as a person, now when you hear somebody speak negatively about that, the mind's going to experience discontentedness because it identifies with this as being you. You're not going to get to a point in the world where everybody speaks completely polite, kind, friendly, and respectful in the world. That's not going to happen in this lifetime because of impermanence. Some people are rude. Some people are polite. Some people are respectful. Some people are disrespectful. But every time somebody says something disrespectful about your self-identity or your self-image, if you allow that to shake up the mind, now you're basing your inner feelings on this impermanent condition. Sometimes people are polite, sometimes they're not. So we're not talking about what's right and wrong here. What we're talking about is what's causing the discontentedness. And in this particular case, as it relates to the universal truth of non-self, if the mind believes or mistakenly holds on to or has this misperception that this physical body or mind is you, then the mind is going to experience discontentedness whenever you experience disagreeable speech related to this personal self-image or this self-identity that's being held on to in the mind. So this is something that we will explore and dig into as we get going on this path, but I was just interested to introduce it here so that you know it's part of the three universal truths. You can really kind of set this aside for now, and we will talk about it in more detail later. But let's move on to talking about the Four Noble Truths. And in order to do that, we need to first be sure that you understand what is craving desire attachment. This is going to be important as we talk about the Four Noble Truths. What craving desire attachment is, also known as expectations, wants, holding, grasping, or clinging, this is how the mind has a mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. It has this yearning for something. It's pulling in the direction of the objects of its affection. It wants certain things. The mind is craving, it's desiring, it's attached, it has expectations, wants, it's holding on, it's grasping, yearning, clinging to things. This is what we call craving desire attachment. It's a little bit of a different definition than what maybe you're using in language. When you think about a craving, you might think about being hungry. Or when you think about a desire, you might think about something you'd like to do in life. But when we talk about craving, desire, attachment, or expectations, wants, holding, grasping, clinging in the Buddhist teachings, we're talking about how the mind pulls in the direction of the objects of its affection, having this mental longing for something with a strong eagerness. And now with that understanding, let's talk about the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths, the Buddha describes them in various detail. He has very detailed teachings. And what I've done here in the way that I explain the Four Noble Truths is explain it in a way that you can understand it and then directly apply it to your life. So we'll explore this. And then in other classes, we go through and look at the actual words of the Buddha, exactly how he taught the Four Noble Truths. So the first Noble Truth is everyone that is unenlightened will experience discontentedness. So if you experience these conditioned feelings where the mind is happy, excited, elated, thrilled, euphoria, that's discontentedness. You know the mind's unenlightened. If you experience sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, those painful feelings, then you know the mind is unenlightened. Or if you experience boredom, loneliness, shyness, any kind of uncomfortableness or displeasure, this is those feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, then you know the mind is currently unenlightened because it's basing its inner feelings on these impermanent conditions. And it's no big deal because there's lots of unenlightened people in the world. The goal is to learn 
to reflect and practice attaining this wisdom where you can then experience the enlightened mind. Now, the first noble truth is explaining the problem, essentially explaining that, yeah, there's all this discontentedness where the mind, each individual human's mind, is experiencing these conditioned feelings. Well, now the second noble truth is going to explain the cause of those feelings. The Buddha explains that the cause of discontentedness is our own cravings, desires, attachments, because the mind wants everything to be permanent when everything in the world is impermanent. So we're going to say that a few times, and I'm going to give you some examples to help you see it. So discontentedness is caused by our own craving, desire, attachments, that mental longing with a strong eagerness, the yearning, the way the mind is pulling toward the objects of its affection. Because the mind wants things to be permanent when everything is impermanent. So here's some examples. If you've ever been in a relationship where the two of you were together, you had a certain relationship, when you first came together, things were wonderful, they were joyful, you guys met each other, wow, this is great feelings, everything feels so wonderful, right? Because you didn't have any expectations, you didn't have any wants, you weren't craving anything from this individual. So things were actually quite peaceful at the beginning of the relationship. But at some point during the relationship, the craving, the desire, the attachment, the expectations, the wants start coming in from both of you. And now at some point you experience discontentedness and the mind keeps getting discontent, sadness, anger, frustration, right? As you go through this relationship. And now at some point you guys decide to end the relationship and you separate. But even in ending the relationship, the mind is sad. It might be angered. You might experience loneliness or boredom during the time of the split of that relationship. That relationship ended because it was impermanent. But the mind craved permanence. The mind had this longing, this yearning, this strong eagerness to hold on to this person permanently. And that's what actually caused the discontentedness. That's what caused the sadness or the anger or the loneliness or the boredom. The person that left or the person that you chose to leave from, they didn't cause your mind to be discontent. You actually caused it yourself because of this craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness, wanting things to be a certain way having certain expectations. And then for a period of time after that relationship was over, the mind was discontent. But then at some point you let it go and then the mind decided it was going to then be peaceful, right? Another example of this, say you get a brand new car and you purchase this brand new car. And when you purchase it, it's very shiny. It's very beautiful. This red shiny sports car you go to the store, you park it outside, and then you go inside and you come out and someone scratched the car. And now the mind's angry, it's frustrated, it's irritated, it's annoyed, right? The person who scratched the car didn't cause the anger. We're not talking about what's right or wrong because in a perfect world, the car wouldn't get scratched. But we live in an impermanent world where things are not permanent. So what caused the mind to be discontent and feeling that anger when you saw the scratch on the car is that the mind was craving permanence, wanting this car to look that way permanently. And when you saw the scratch on the car, that's what caused the mind to then experience those painful feelings. And there's people that have gone really far with that, right? That has gone into fights and arguments, even murder and ended up in jail because the mind craved permanence. Because somebody else could have that same experience and their mind can be better trained and they can come out and see the scratch on the car and say, huh, thank goodness I got insurance. I better take the car and get it fixed. Well, if it was the scratch that caused the anger, 
then everybody would get angry, right? Because it's the scratch and every single person would get angry. But it's not that way. The, what caused the anger is inside the mind. It had this craving, desire, attachment, this yearning, this longing, this strong eagerness for things to be permanent because the mind was unawakened to this wisdom that it didn't understand the natural laws of existence and it doesn't understand impermanence. Just like it didn't understand the natural law of gravity and we fell down and we cried and eventually we learned to get over that, that's what you need to do with these teachings is train the mind to understand impermanence and that the mind's not going to constantly get this permanence that it desires. Moving on to the third noble truth, the way that you eliminate this discontentedness is you eliminate the mind's craving, desire, attachment. You have to train the mind to not crave permanence. This is going to Sajani's question is once you understand the universal truth of impermanence and you see it in the world around you, it doesn't mean that you're going to magically start accepting that and your mind's going to magically start being peaceful just because you heard me say that the universal truth of impermanence is the truth. Instead, you need to deeply train the mind through this whole entire path to enlightenment to understand impermanence and to eliminate the mind's craving, desire, attachments, those expectations, the wants, the yearning, the longing, the chasing after the objects of its affection. And when you train the mind to do that over a consistent long-term period of time, then the mind removes the condition that's causing the discontentedness. It's this condition of craving, desire, attachment, the mind longing for things to be a certain way, craving permanence, that's causing the discontentedness. So when we eliminate that condition and the mind no longer is longing with a strong eagerness, craving permanence, then it can reside peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Oh, somebody scratched the car. Hmm, I need to get that fixed. I'll probably do that in the next few weeks when I get time. Rather than, what? Someone scratched my car? Oh my goodness, right? Instead of going into a fit of rage, a person whose mind is awakened to the universal truth of impermanence, rather than reacting to the situation with anger, can respond to it with wisdom and just make wise decisions. Because just like the car being beautiful without a scratch was impermanent, this scratch across the car is also impermanent. It can be fixed, right? So rather than allowing the mind to get angry or sad or frustrated because of this impermanent condition, let's just fix it and get it fixed. Or if you don't have insurance, then maybe you just accept, okay, I've got a scratch on the car and that's just the way it's going to be. How you decide to respond is your free will. Whether you get it fixed or not, totally up to you. But allowing the mind to be shaken up by this impermanent condition of a scratch on the car is only going to create painful feelings in the mind. And someone who deeply trains the mind to eliminate this craving, desire, attachment isn't going to experience discontentedness when they buy the brand new car. Yay, I got a brand new car. As soon as you do that, then the mind's going to experience painful feelings as this car gets scratches or gets an accident or something else. So I've already alluded to it, but that fourth noble truth is the path to eliminate discontentedness is the Eightfold Path. By learning, reflecting, and practicing the Eightfold Path, the mind gradually moves closer and closer to enlightenment where the mind can reside peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So essentially what we've got in these four simple statements is the first noble truth is the problem. Everyone that is unenlightened will experience discontentedness. The second noble truth is the cause of the problem. Discontentedness is caused by our own cravings, desires, attachments, because the mind wants everything to be permanent when everything in the world is impermanent. 
The third noble truth gives us the solution to the problem. The elimination of discontentedness is possible by eliminating cravings, desires, attachments. The fourth noble truth gives us the complete path that tells us what is the complete solution to this discontent mind. The path to eliminating discontentedness is the Eightfold Path. That is the path to enlightenment where you move the mind to being peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently. So let me pause here and see what questions you guys have to see how I can help you to better understand these. The way that you ask a question is put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. The moderators will see those, or you can raise your hand electronically, and they'll call on you to ask your question or follow-up questions. To clarify, David, when the Buddha lays out the Four Noble Truths, he isn't laying them out in an accusatory way or placing blame. He's just explaining the natural state of the unenlightened mind in which we're essentially all born into, right? Exactly. He's explaining the universal truths. He's explaining these natural laws of existence to help you understand why the mind is experiencing what it's experienced your whole life so that then you can take action to resolve it. Whereas if you didn't know, if you had kind of ignorance or unknowing of true reality that you were causing your own discontentedness, then you're going to blame other people. And you've probably done this already in your life. We all did, right? Before we establish right view, we have wrong view. And what wrong view is, is we blame others for the anger or the sadness or the loneliness or despair. We think that it's other people or it's the situation that's actually causing the discontent mind when in reality we're causing it ourselves. So essentially what the Four Noble Truths are encouraging you, motivating you, guiding you, and helping you see is that yes, you're causing your own discontentedness, not as an accusatory way, but seeing true reality so that then you can accept responsibility for this discontentedness and then you can fix it. Because if everyone else is causing your discontentedness, if everyone else is causing you to be angry, that means you have to train 7.5 billion people in the world to do things your way. And as soon as you get this training program up and running for everyone in the world, you have to make sure all these new beings that are being born go through your training program so that you can train them how to do things your way. And then you can be peaceful, right? No, that's not the way it works. Instead, what the Buddha is saying is you only have to train one being. You only have to train one mind. And if you can train that mind, then you can exist in the world understanding these natural laws of existence. And now these impermanent situations don't shake up your mind. So by accepting responsibility for your own feelings and emotions, now you can gain control over them because now you can train the mind to eliminate these unwelcomed feelings. But as long as you blame others for the feelings that you're experiencing, if you have wrong view, then you'll never be able to experience enlightenment because it's everyone else that's causing your discontentedness. But when you realize that your own mind is what's causing the discontentedness, then it empowers you to now take action to resolve it and fix it. And that's what the whole path is about. One of the ways that I explain it is it's the very best self-help program you'll ever encounter because it's been proven and tested over 2,500 years. It's well vetted that it works to improve the condition of the mind. And you can see that for yourself as the discontentedness gradually diminishes. But you'll never, ever get a chance to experience that if you don't first accept and understand and see the truth with wisdom that it's craving, desire, attachment that's causing your own discontentedness. One of the ways to come to this understanding is rather than use the examples that I gave you, is right now, think back to the most recent time that you were angry or frustrated or irritated. It might have even been today or yesterday. Think about what it was that caused the anger, sadness, irritation, or frustration. Not the other person or not the situation. There was something you wanted. There was something you expected. There was something your mind was longing for and you wanted. 
And when you didn't get it, the mind experienced sadness or anger or frustration. And if you can go through that exercise and you can think back to any situations in recent times where your mind has experienced these discontent feelings and you can see how you, it's your own longing, your own yearning, your own strong eagerness that's causing those discontent feelings, then you will have made what the Buddha calls the breakthrough. You will have broken through this wrong view. You will have broken through the delusion or the ignorance or the unknowing of true reality, thinking that somebody else is causing your discontentedness. So if you can take a situation where you were recently discontent and the mind was experiencing discontentedness and see that it was your own craving, desire, attachment, mental longing with a strong eagerness, when you see that and then you can break through and now from this point forward, every time you see discontentedness arise in the mind, you will know that it's not somebody else or the situation that's causing it. It's your own craving, desire, attachment. And you might need help from your teacher to see that a bit more. It's not going to be just one class in Eureka. You got it, right? It takes time to develop this. But the Buddha is certainly not blaming you or saying you're at fault or you've done anything wrong because all unenlightened minds experience this, including the Buddha before he became the Buddha. He experienced discontentedness and he experienced wrong view and he experienced the blaming of people that it was them who caused his discontentedness. It's not until he awakened to these natural laws that he saw the truth. And then once he experienced this gradual progression to enlightenment, he was then able to share these teachings in a way that will help you to see the truth and experience the same results of this enlightened mind. Would you say that right view and the cultivation of wisdom are central parts of the path? Is this essentially where our path begins and relies on our level of right view? Yes, without right view, none of the rest of the teachings of the Buddha will ever make sense because in right view, you establish that you're the one that needs to do the work, that it's your anger, it's your sadness, it's your frustration, it's your boredom, it's your loneliness, it's all being created in your mind. So therefore, you need to train this mind in order to move it to this enlightened mental state. So all the other teachings the Buddha shares is all about training your own mind. Whereas if you continue to not have right view and you blamed other people for the feelings that you're experiencing, then why are you training your mind? Why would you ever embark on a path of improving and developing your life practice if you're perfect already and it's everyone else that's causing your mind to be discontent? So you have to establish right view. And this is why I teach it at the very beginning like this. And at other points, you'll hear me discuss this at other points throughout the program because it's so important for you to deeply understand this and see the truth in it for you to be able to build all the other teachings on top of it. Would you say that some understanding of right view is what starts us on our path, but then as we begin on the path and we validate right view in the world, it cultivates our wisdom and our right view is strengthened such that there's this relationship in which we have right view and then we act in the world, and then as we act in the world, we increase our right view and it's sort of a cycle, I suppose. Yeah, you could see it that way. You know, even hearing me sh share this with you, if you fully see what I'm talking about and what the Buddha was sharing here, even in you fully seeing it in this class, you'll leave class and in a couple of days or a couple of weeks, something will happen and you'll blame other people and you won't necessarily be able to see how your own mind is causing the discontentedness. But that's where you reach out to your teacher in a private message or ask for personal guidance, there's a way to schedule that, or you ask a question in class, have your teacher help you to see how you're causing your own discontentedness. Because until you see it clearly in every single situation that you're in, the mind might hear in class like this and be like, yeah, I see that, you know, that that's very true. But then when you step out into the world, the mind's right back into thinking that other people are causing your discontentedness. So for example, if you're driving a car and somebody cuts you off in traffic, well, then you get angry because someone cuts you off and you think it's their fault. 
No, it's actually the mind was craving permanently to have this lane and you were craving to have a certain amount of distance between you and another car. You were having this longing, this strong eagerness. So remember, what we're talking about here isn't necessarily what's right or wrong in terms of, yeah, when you change lanes, you should give somebody some space so that you're not so close to them. That's the right way to change lanes. But everyone's not going to permanently do that because that would be permanence. This world is impermanent. So you're going to experience situations where you're driving and somebody cuts you off. And if every time that happens, you choose to get angry about it, then your mind is being shaken up by these impermanent conditions. Or another example, if you have a mobile phone and you have this longing and strong eagerness for this mobile phone, you're attached to it. Uh, we need communication. It's important to have communication in our life. But if you have this mental longing where you're wanting this mobile phone and it provides you so much value because you're able to communicate with people and function a certain way, well, this phone is impermanent. So when it breaks or you lose it or someone steals it or it just stops functioning because it gets old or any of these other impermanent things that can happen to the phone, if your mind is holding on to that phone really tightly, when those impermanent conditions arise, the mind's going to be frustrated. It's going to be irritated. It's going to be angry when this phone no longer works. So you've got to get to the point where you understand every single thing around is impermanent and it will leave you someday in one way or another. And by holding on and clinging and trying to hold these things tightly, it's only going to cause painful feelings in the mind. Thank you, David. Those are all the questions we have at the moment. Okay. So let's look at the next thing that we had planned to discuss today, which is right intention. Okay. So right view, we're going to continue to talk about that at different times. There's reading in the book. There's other classes that I taught. There's going to be multiple times that we discuss it. You'll need to see this more and more as you go forward on this path. You're not going to be an expert in these teachings right away. There's training that's required. It's a dedicated practice of developing your life practice. It's real work to get to enlightenment. Otherwise, everyone would already be enlightened. So no matter how much you connected with what I just shared or how deeply or, or not that you understand what I just shared, learn it to a certain degree. Ask questions about it as you go because only through asking questions will you deeply understand. And then as you progress day by day, you read, you watch videos, you attend classes, and you practice in order to train the mind to gradually work towards enlightenment. Because with right view, the way that we eliminate discontentedness is we eliminate those craving desire attachments. Well, the way that you eliminate craving desire attachment is using techniques that the Buddha taught. And I'm going to be teaching some of those on Wednesday with breathing mindfulness meditation. That's one of the key antidotes or the key methods of training that we use to eliminate this craving desire attachment in the mind. We can't just talk about it. And then just because you learned it in class, the mind's going to transform. That's why we go from intellectual learning to reflection to moving it into practice. So now with the intellectual learning, that craving desire attachment is what's causing discontentedness. We then reflect on that, which is kind of what we've been doing now, just kind of talking about it. But you're going to need to be doing some more thinking and reflecting on that. And then you have to move it into practice where you see from this point forward, whenever the mind is experiencing pleasant feelings, painful feelings, or feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, that it's craving desire attachment that's causing it. That's how you move it into practice. Start identifying what the mind wants in this craving that's causing those feelings. And then as part of that practice, we use breathing mindfulness meditation and some other things that I'll introduce to you as we progress in this practice and in this program that will help you to eliminate craving desire attachment from the mind. And gradually over time, as you eliminate craving desire attachment, then the 
enlightened mind can come forward more and more because you're diminishing the condition that's causing the discontentedness. By you diminishing craving, desire, attachment, then the mind won't be holding on with this strong eagerness so much that through this training that the Buddha shares and that you decide to do on your own, then you see that the mind then functions in the world very differently based on this training of the mind and this wisdom that you're experiencing. So now moving into right intention, which is the next part of the Eightfold Path. This is the second step in the Eightfold Path. Here's the Buddha's words again, and then I'll explain it for you. The Buddha's words are, in what monks is right intention? The intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, the intention of harmlessness. This monks is called right intention. So let's look at these three components of right intention so that you can see how the Buddhist teachings are being shared and why that is. Remember, everything on this path is all about awakening to this natural law of gamma, this cause and effect, action and result, essentially the results of our decisions. If we put out wholesome decisions, wholesome things will happen. If we put out unwholesome decisions, unwholesome things will happen. So right here at the very beginning of the Eightfold Path, once you understand right view in that you're causing all your own discontentedness, the next step, right intention, is all about the first part is the intention of renunciation. Or another way to think about this is relinquishment. This is the interest and willingness to let go and give things up, not to hold on to things so tightly, to let go of the unwholesome things in the mind, the false beliefs, the false perceptions of reality. Because as long as you hold on and the mind keeps holding on and wanting to hold on, then it won't experience this liberation or this freedom, this enlightenment. So you'll still be able to have material objects. You'll still be able to have relationships and a job and all the things in your life that you currently have. You just need to train the mind to not hold on to them so tightly. That's what the intention of renunciation or the intention of relinquishment is. Develop this interest or willingness to let go and allow the mind to give up and train the mind to let go of any false beliefs or false perceptions, letting go of unwholesomeness. And then with that natural law of gamma that we talked about of what you put out comes back to you, if you put out ill will of anger and hatred and all the lesser versions of that, then that's what's going to come back to you. So if you put out animosity and bitterness in your for example, speech or your actions, then that's what's going to come back to you. If you speak to your life partner or your children, your coworkers, your siblings, your parents, your neighbors in harsh ways with impoliteness, unkindness, unfriendliness, and disrespect, then that's what's going to come back to you. This practice is all about your practice and improving the condition of your mind. And by you choosing to no longer have ill will and then training the mind to do that, because we again, we can talk about it, but then you need to actively train the mind to eliminate ill will. And that's what we'll get to as part of this program as well. So the Buddha is saying you need to have this intention to practice non ill will. Or another way to say that is loving kindness or goodwill. Goodwill is the opposite of ill will. So having the intention of goodwill or having the intention of non-ill will. So by practicing where you're having this genuine interest in seeing others be well, this is loving kindness or non-ill will or goodwill. By you choosing to set that intention in the mind and train the mind towards that, Now the decisions that you make in the world are going to be wholesome. And more and more as you make more and more wholesome decisions, more and more wholesome things will happen for you. But as long as you hold on to any animosity or bitterness, any kind of anger, hatred, resentment, as long as you hold on to that stuff, it's just poisoning the mind. 
And then your decisions are going to be coming through that. And now you put those decisions out into the world and that's what's coming back to you. So the way that you experience more peacefulness in your life is by training the mind to eliminate these things because everything you experience in the world is experienced through the mind. And as long as the mind holds on to any animosity or bitterness or hatred or anger, the mind is polluted, it's defiled, it's tainted. So therefore, it's not going to experience this peaceful, calm, serene and content with joy because it's got this resentment in there. It's got this anger. It's got this hatred. So what this path is doing is moving these conditions out that are causing this polluted, defiled aspects of the mind so that then this brightness or this brilliance, this peacefulness, this joy can shine through when we remove this pollution or this conditions that's causing the ill will. The third aspect of right intention is having the intention of practicing harmlessness. Because as long as there's the intention to cause harm, even in the slightest little way, even with like a little bit of sarcasm, there's an intention there to cause a little bit of harm, that harm's gonna come back to you. This is why if you go around being sarcastic to people, that's gonna come back to you. If we go around and treat others impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful, that's what's going to come back to us. So here in the second step with right intention, we need to have the intention of harmlessness, of not causing harm to other beings. Because as long as we are causing harm to other beings, that harm is going to come back to us. So this is right intention. The intention of renunciation, letting go. The intention of non-ill will, which is essentially to practice goodwill, or loving kindness and the intention to practice harmlessness or not being interested or being incapable of causing harm to others. And now the whole rest of the path that we're going to talk about on Sunday next week and beyond is all about how do we not cause harm to others through our speech, our actions, our livelihood, and how do we train the mind to acquire mental discipline through right effort, through right mindfulness, and right concentration so that we can restrain this mind. Because even hearing, yeah, that sounds great, not causing harm, that sounds wonderful. But the mind, if it doesn't have discipline, if it can't be restrained, your mind is going to produce speech, for example, that causes harm, or it's going to produce actions that cause harm. So as you learn more and more about this path and you train the mind in meditation, but then also you train the mind outside of meditation, the path to enlightenment includes meditation, but that's just one component of the overall life practice. This eightfold path is something that you're practicing all the time, that if you meditated, for example, and then you went out into the world and you started speaking unkind to people and disrespectful to people, your mind's not going to be peaceful. It's not going to be joyful. You're going to have all kinds of unwholesome things happening around you. It doesn't matter what you're doing in meditation. If you go outside and you're speaking or you're having actions or you're causing harm in the world, this harm is going to come back to you. So yes, there is meditation that's part of this path, and that's an important component of this path. But that's only one step of the entire Eightfold Path. So as we progress in this program, you're going to see how the Buddhist teachings all come together where you'll be able to be practicing the teachings in daily life. And as you do, you'll see that you'll clean up a lot of the decisions that you've been making in the past that are leading to unwholesome results that now you'll start making wiser and wiser decisions at your own free will and they will produce more and more wholesome results for you. So let's see what questions you guys have here related to right intention. I had a quick question regarding the distinction between ill will and harmlessness. They seem quite similar as oftentimes when we cause harm, we have ill will, but is harmlessness also referring to the times when we may be acting out of ignorance, for instance, and causing harm? Yes, you know, that's the whole 
problem that the Buddha discovered, the number one problem in the mind, which we'll talk about when we get to chapter eight. It's called the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots. There's these three major problems, craving, anger, and ignorance, or the unknowing of true reality. When we don't know that we're causing our own discontentedness, sure, we go around and we blame everyone else. And we start to blame other people for causing our sadness or our anger or frustration. And that leads to more and more problems in our life because we just go around and we blame everyone else. And that's from our unknowing of true reality, our ignorance. But also that same ignorance or unknowing of true reality when we don't understand the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result, the results of our decisions, we can go around with bitterness. We can go around uh, with an interest to cause harm. We can be a little bit sarcastic and think that that's okay. We're going to try to teach this person a lesson. And by teaching that person a lesson, we've accomplished something in the world. Well, by putting out sarcasm, for example, or any kind of harm whatsoever, then that's only going to come back to you. And it's only going to harm your own mind. So what the Buddha is helping you awaken to is this understanding of true reality, this natural law of karma, this cause and effect, the results of your decisions that by you deciding to practice harmlessness and not being interested to harm other beings, then this is going to produce the right thinking or the right thought. This is the way some people translate this step of the Eightfold Path. Instead of right intention, they will translate it as right thought or right thinking. So by you having the thought or the thinking that I'm not interested in causing harm to any other beings, because I know if I do, that's only going to come back and harm my own mind, then you have more wisdom to be willing to shed and eradicate and eliminate these unwholesome decisions where we are causing harm in the world. But you need the wisdom of the Buddha to understand what are those harms that we're causing. So when you get exposure to things like right speech, right action, right livelihood, for example, you'll start seeing what the Buddha is talking about when he's talking about practicing right speech, how we can clean up our speech and ensure that we're not causing harm through our speech. He doesn't tell you how to speak. He just gives you guidance to help you see some guidelines about how you can practice right speech. And then you'll find the words, you'll find the phrasing, you'll find through free will how you would like to speak in the world. But by you learning and reflecting and practicing this guidance of the Buddha with this intention of not causing harm, then you're going to be more actively interested in uh, moving the mind to practice something like right speech, for example. Would you say that that is the whole point of this Eightfold Path is to not cause harm? And if we don't cause harm, negative comment doesn't come back to us. And then it essentially allows us to have more peace of mind, to cultivate peace of mind. Is that what we're really going for here? Yeah, I mean, essentially, that's what you're looking at, James. That's what this whole Eightfold Path is about, because as long as we cause harm through our decisions, that harm is going to be returned to us. And there's definitely aspects of the mind that you have to train to eliminate discontentedness, right? But also you have to not only have this wisdom, you have to improve your moral conduct. Because as long as you go around and you're making unwholesome decisions, then you're going to experience unwholesome gamma. And we're going to be talking about gamma in chapter nine as part of this program where we're going to go a lot more detail into what gamma is. But that's what this whole path is about is ensuring that you see that causal effect between the decisions that you make and the results that they produce. And if you can't see that now, it's okay because I'm going to help you see it as we progress in this program. But every single thing that we experience in life is as a result of our decisions. Nothing just happens to us by chance. There's no such thing as good luck, for example. Someone who chooses to play the lottery, for example, they haven't just gotten good luck. No, they chose to play the lottery. They chose to go to that particular place. They chose those numbers. They chose to hold on to the ticket. 
They chose to see what the numbers are the next day. They chose to cash in the ticket and now they've won the lottery. But that's not good luck. That's just choices that they made. And I'm not saying that wealth is going to lead to happiness because that's not true or else every single wealthy person in the world would be perfectly, permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. But that's not what we see. Wealth doesn't necessarily lead to happiness, but wealth doesn't necessarily lead to unhappiness either. The wealth isn't the problem, for example. It's the way the mind is having craving or longing or yearning for the wealth that that's what causes the mind to be discontent. So this natural law of gamma of cause and effect, you have to see that every single thing that you experience in life is as a result of your decisions. So your decisions to come to this class today or listen to this podcast or watch this YouTube video, by you choosing to do that, that's a choice that you've made. And the effect is that you're learning wisdom from the Buddha. And now that wisdom can be used in your life to make better decisions. And then when you make a choice to meditate, for example, you're choosing to train the mind. And as a result of that, the mind becomes more peaceful. And with the mind becoming more peaceful, you make better and better decisions in the world through the wisdom that the Buddha will share with you throughout this whole path to enlightenment. So as long as you continue to be disinterested in harmlessness, or as long as you maintain an interest to have any kind of harm in the world, then that harm is going to keep coming back to you. So what the Buddha is teaching as the second step is having this willingness to let go, this renunciation or relinquishment, this willingness, this interest, this thought of practicing goodwill, having an interest in seeing all beings be well, and this practice of harmlessness, not being interested in causing harm to any other beings. And if you're able to develop that through the teachings as you progress, you'll see that this will benefit you in being able to produce wiser and wiser decisions that will lead to better and better results. Now, when you hear these things, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. You're like, I'm not interested in harming anyone. But the mind needs to be trained much deeper than just kind of an intellectual acknowledgement that you're not interested in harming. You have to deeply understand what that means by digging deeper and deeper into the teachings of the Buddha and incorporating it into your life practice. And that's what learning the rest of this path is going to do for you. I was wondering in regards to right intention, is right intention a decision or a commitment that we make or is it something that we cultivate more so over time? Right intention is more of your thinking and your thoughts and your and it gets cultivated over time. Decisions are something different. The Buddha referred to these as part of what we call the five aggregates or also referred to as volitional formations. The decisions are what ultimately is leading to certain results. And when there's this unknowing of true reality or this ignorance in the mind, this lack of wisdom, then when we make certain decisions, those decisions are based in craving, anger, and ignorance or unknowing of true reality. And when we make those decisions in an unwholesome way, then unwholesomeness comes back to us. So it's learning the teachings, reflecting on them, gaining this wisdom that the mind awakens to this wisdom, understands the natural laws of existence, and then we make wiser and wiser choices in the world with wholesome decisions leading to wholesome results. And this is where we see the condition of the mind and the condition of our life gradually improve over time. But in order to do that, you need to be able to cultivate right intention where you have no interest in harming others. You have this interest in seeing all beings be well, and you have this willingness to let go because the things that are keeping the mind in the unenlightened state are being held on to in the mind. So you need to have this willingness to let those go and give up certain unwholesome aspects of the mind that are currently there. For example, something like selfishness. We have to let that go. We have to practice generosity or anger, hatred. We have to let that go and practice loving kindness or 
kind of an indifference or uncaring mind. We have to let that go and practice compassion. Or jealousy. We need to let that go and practice sympathetic joy. So I'm just kind of going through a few examples here, but what this whole program is about and the reason why it's seven months long is that it's going to take you some time to deeply understand these teachings. The Buddha taught for 45 years and you're going to need some time to really dive into the teachings and absorb them and progress along the way. So as you learn in this program each Sunday, I'll be taking a major topic and sharing that with you. And then on Wednesdays, we'll be doing the training with meditation. But then also you'll need to be doing that outside of class as well. And then eventually we'll get to a point where we'll be going chapter by chapter in the book. And you'll be able to read the book prior to class or after class or both. And I'll gradually help you build up more and more where you get the mind noticing more and more that there's this diminishing of this discontentedness over time. And then as you progress, you may get to the point in this life where you completely eliminate all discontentedness whatsoever and the mind is enlightened. You've spoken about the the importance of investigation rather than simply faith. And now that we've looked at right view and right intention, do you feel like that it's an appropriate time for us to go out in the world and begin that investigation, even though we're just one class in? Yeah, and this is part of that investigation, right, is, is learning the teachings, is actively learning with a teacher. You wouldn't be able to attain enlightenment on your own. You need guidance. You need resources. You need somebody to share the teachings with you so you can do that intellectual learning and start to do the reflection. But then, even now, you can start moving this stuff into practice where with right view, for example, as I mentioned, start looking in the world to see how things are impermanent and that there's no steady, constant, fixed state. Start noticing that universal truth of impermanence. Start noticing those pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neither painful nor pleasant, that universal truth of discontentedness. Start noticing the four universal truths. Start noticing how the mind is discontent and it moves around experiencing discontentedness. Notice how it's causing its own discontentedness, the craving, the desire, the attachment, the expectations, the wants, the mental longing with strong eagerness. Notice how that's causing all those discontent feelings. And notice how when you let go of the craving, desire, attachments, the mind lets go of the discontentedness. So in that example where you break up from a certain partner and the mind's sad or angry for a period of time, eventually you get to the point where you let it go and you move on with your life and you're no longer angry about that person or that situation, right? Because you finally let it go. So Notice that, that the mind can let go of its wants, its craving, its yearning for permanence, wanting to hold on to things. And when you let that go, that's when the mind can then experience peacefulness. It will no longer experience discontentedness. And then here with right intention, notice how when you train the mind to let go through what we're going to practice on Wednesday, that the mind can experience more and more peacefulness. Notice how by practicing loving kindness or a genuine interest in seeing others be well, that that comes through in your daily interactions with people. And that's going to produce better results in your personal and professional relationships. Notice how when you start off your day and you continue with this intention of harmlessness, that you interact with people in a different way and it produces different results for you. This is why you don't have to believe the Buddhist teachings. Instead, you investigate them, you reflect, and then you practice. And in your day-to-day life, if you practice what's being shared here, you'll see that things will improve, but it's through your own decisions. I can't give you enlightenment. The Buddha can't give you enlightenment. There's no rites, rituals, ceremonies, or worship that will give you enlightenment. It's through your intellectual learning, your reflection, and your practice that you see that as you build up your life practice, the discontentedness in the mind slowly diminishes and decreases. Thank you, David. That's a great reminder that this is a 
path that we pursue passively, but it's an active life practice. Yeah, it's very active. It's an independent journey. It's your journey to enlightenment. And your teacher is here to provide guidance, to provide resources, to provide you support and encouragement along the way. But each individual practitioner needs to do the work. And there'll be times where, oh, it's so wonderful and it's, and it's so joyful to progress on this path and see the discontentedness diminish. But then there'll be other times where it's quite a struggle and difficult because you're essentially almost like uh, reprogramming the mind because the mind's done things in a certain way for all of its life that it's not used to doing things in this new way. It's used to when somebody does something you don't like to bark or to be angry or to be hostile and then to blame them for they're the ones who are causing you to be angry. That's kind of what you've grown up with or that's what you've been doing for a certain portion of your life. But now to kind of view that through a completely different lens and see that it's you that's causing that discontentedness, it's sometimes quite a struggle and difficult for the mind. But that's why you have a community of friends to be able to help you. That's why you have a teacher to reach out to and you can get help as you start having some of those challenges along the path. Thank you, David. Those are all the questions we have for today. Okay. Well, I will just end by sharing something with you guys that I realize this is a new class for a lot of you. This is maybe the first time you've even ever studied the Buddhist teachings or maybe you've studied them in other places. And some of the things that I'm sharing are maybe different than what you've heard before. And that's actually a good thing, right? Because if your mind is currently unenlightened and the things that I'm sharing are exactly the same things you've heard before, then there's no growth here for you, right? So I realize that for some of you, this is your first step into the path to enlightenment. You haven't experienced what it's like to study with a teacher that's sharing the Buddhist teachings with you. Or you may have studied before and it's just a different teacher sharing things in a different way. But what's important for you to understand as part of your path and as part of your journey that you will need to investigate. You will need to think about what's being shared. You will need to ask questions at certain times when you have certain questions that come to mind. So I make various different ways for you to be able to do this. As you read, as you take these classes, you're going to need to reach out and get clarity. It's not possible for you to just sit in a class or read a book and get to enlightenment. You're going to need clarification. And the ways that you do that is you can post a question in the Facebook group, Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, and I will answer that for you. Students and members in that group aren't able to answer your question. If anybody did, I would just delete the comment, but the people in there pretty much know that, you know, it's a place where students post questions to get help from a teacher. So you can post your questions in Facebook. You can uh, send me a private message and I can chat with you through either Facebook private message or you can send an email or whatever method of communication that you prefer. You can send a private message. You can ask questions in these online classes on Sunday and Wednesday of the group learning program. There's always opportunities for questions and you're able to either raise your hand or submit your question by comment and get your question asked and answered that way. Or you can schedule personal guidance where there's a link that you can get access to calendly.com forward slash David hyphen Roylands And you can schedule an appointment to talk privately and we can talk live to help you get a chance to know me or me to get a chance to know you or talk about some of the individual challenges or clarifications that you need on the teachings. And all of this is being offered to you openly and freely without any expectation from you. But I would just like you to know that you will need to engage and clarify and and understand what's being taught in order for you to move it into your life practice and start to actively engage with the teachings. So each week you can tune in the same place on Sunday and Wednesday, either Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. We also send this out to other places like Twitch and Periscope. We put it on our podcast as well. You may even be interested to listen back to it more than once if you would like to do that. 
but you'll need to dedicate some time to learning and actively rolling up the sleeves and diving in to understand the teachings. And as you do, you have somebody here that's fully interested to support you and encourage you along this path. You just need to decide to reach out and ultimately do the work. And with you doing the work, there's all the resources and support here for you to learn and reflect and practice and gradually make progress along this path. So I'd like to thank all of you for choosing to learn and practice Gautama Buddha's teachings because it's the very best thing that you could actually do for your life to work on eliminating discontentedness from the mind. I think if I gave you a button and it was, you know, push this button to continue to be angry and frustrated and irritated the rest of your life or push this button to experience this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, I'm pretty sure everybody would push this button, right? Well, it's not a button that you can push. It doesn't happen instantaneously, but it's through gradual training, gradual learning that you can gradually experience that. In these teachings that I'm sharing with you, you should never believe anything that I share. Instead, learn it and then reflect on it and practice it and see the truth. As you gain this wisdom, you'll see the condition of the mind gradually improving. So on Wednesday, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation. It's a four part series where I'm going to be introducing you to meditation as a whole and helping you to understand best practices or some methodology about how to actually practice meditation and why it's practiced, connecting it to what we talked about today in the Four Noble Truths. And then we're going to actually do a guided meditation session together on Wednesday. And then at that point, I will invite you to continue to meditate each day of the week and building up your practice more and more and more. And then for four Wednesdays, we will meet together and I will help you deepen that practice, getting deeper and deeper. And then in between the Wednesdays, as you're practicing, you might come to class with some questions about how things have gone for you. And you might need some clarification and you can ask those questions. On Sunday next week, we'll be going into the next section of the Eightfold Path, which is right speech, right action, and right livelihood. This is where things really start to open up and you start seeing what the Buddha calls the moral conduct of the Eightfold Path. And you can start seeing how by you making the decision to learn this wisdom and improve the decisions around your moral conduct, that that will improve the results that you experience in life. And this is where things really start to open up for you. So I'll see you either this Wednesday or perhaps on Sunday. And if you happen to miss any of these classes throughout the program, just check Facebook, YouTube, or the podcast, and you'll see them recorded there in order to help you learn. Because in Facebook, YouTube, you'll see the audio and the visual aids. In the podcast, you'll see the cleaned up audio, but there's no visual aids. So whichever one works best for you, you'll be able to use that to ensure that you're able to continue to learn and progress in the path. So until next time, have a very lovely day. We'll see you then. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.